just want to welcome you her coming in from online what a joy it is to be in the house of the lord um i just keep thinking of what the psalmist said he said i was glad when they said to me let us go to the house of the lord and it is truly such an honor just to be gathered in the presence of the lord and in hebrews 10 19 it says and so dear brothers and sisters we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and living way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over the God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. So Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the blood. We thank you that it's by your blood that we can draw near this morning, Jesus. That we can come in and boldly enter the throne of grace, God. And we together as a body, we just say, come Lord Jesus, we give you full permission. Come on, we just begin to cry out to the living God. We just say, Lord, we're so hungry for you. We long for your presence, the true and living bread of life. We long for you, Lord. So we say, come, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, we invite you and have your way, King Jesus. Have your way, Lord.
Sing his praise. 
is above them all, Jesus. Cause your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name, it stands above them all. Above all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions. It's the highest, 
voices this morning. Let's sing that. Come on, choir, lift it a little. hands all over the room not across the aisles let's close our eyes just give our attention to the Lord Jesus Lord we give you all the glory this morning thank you for your wonderful presence that is food and life thank you come on just thank him let us be the most thankful church in the world Oh, birth thanksgiving in us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for changing our lives. Thank you for saving our souls and washing us with your holy blood. We thank you, Lord, as a family this morning for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your holiness. And so we pray now in the mighty name of Jesus that the perfect will of God be accomplished this morning. We ask in the mighty name of Jesus that you, wonderful Holy Spirit, would begin to move through this room and in our hearts and open our minds to the beauty of Jesus. Burn our hearts up in first love. I thank you, Lord, that many will be healed today, many saved, many touched by your Spirit, that every visitor who's come in and sacrifice to be here that they would leave burning in the power of the Holy Spirit come on agree with me that they would leave burning in the power of the Holy Spirit teach us your word feed us wonderful shepherd and we give you all the glory all the glory and we thank you for the blood that we plead now over our lives, over this ministry, over this building, over our families. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. Come on, lift the praise. Can you do that? Come on. Thank you, Lord. Come on, lift the praise, lift the praise. Give you all the glory, all the glory, all the glory, all the glory. Thank you, wonderful Jesus. 
thank you for your love and your kindness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Amen. Come on, one more. Jesus, we give you all the glory. All of it. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Blessed be your name. Forever and ever. All the glory is yours. Amen. Amen. You can go back to your seats for those of you who came forward. Why don't you let a few people know you love them? And let's welcome Mackenzie up as she receives this morning's offering. Come on, let Mackenzie know you love her. I'm going to do this just very quickly before Mackenzie starts because uh, there's somebody very special who celebrated her birthday recently. And she slides out about this time every, she has to go take care of some stuff. Floy Beth is an absolute treasure. And for those of you who don't know who she is, let's just put, there's a camera right there on you, Floy Beth. <laughs> and, uh, Floy Beth, could you just stand so they know who they're clapping for? That's Floyd Beth. She's a treasure and a gift. <laughs> Floyd Beth has been here since we started Jesus School. She's an incredible member of our staff, our team. And she just carries just the beautiful humility of Jesus and joy. And she's very sneaky with her humor. And we all love that about her. She could be the governor of Florida. I don't know a more proud Floridian in all the world. I heard that for her birthday, she went to see Payne's Prairie, which is just a prairie between Ocala and Gainesville. I mean, it's nice to look at. I went to school up there. I can't say that would have been one of my birthday stops, but they do have buffalo there. I don't know. Did you know that? And gators, obviously. So anyways, Floyd Beth, we love you. You are a treasure and a gift. I'm so grateful you're on our team. And uh, every time I see her, I just light up and laugh. And I don't know why. <laughs> She's just amazing. So can we just wish Floyd Beth a happy birthday just one more time? <laughs> love you. All right, Mackenzie, it's all yours. just a sweetness of his presence in the room this morning. I'm going to read from Genesis 28. And this is when the Lord encounters Jacob at Bethel and he gives him this, this promise and this blessing over him and his family. But what I want to focus on is Jacob's response to the Lord when he comes and it starts in verse 16 where it says, Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on top of it. And I'm gonna to skip to verse 20. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way, and keep me in this way that I'm going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I can come back to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. And I love this because first, he recognizes it as God's house. Because he came and he was there. 
in his response and his worship is first to pour oil out and then to recognize that God will give him what he needs, that he will give him food and he will give him clothing. But then for him to say, surely of everything that you give me, so he recognizes that it all comes from the Lord, but that he will give a tenth. And as I was reading this, I thought of Psalm 23 where it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or the new living says, I have all that I need. And he recognizes who sustains him. He recognizes who feeds him and who clothes him. And that that was his response when the Lord came in this morning in worship. I was like, Lord, you are here and I can feel your presence. And I wanna respond to you rightly in this way. To know that you are my provider, you are my sustainer and in you there is no lack. And to give him what he is worthy of. Because if we know him as, as shepherd and we truly know him, we know that we have all that we need. So there doesn't need to be this fear in giving him what already belongs to him. So Jesus, we just look to you this morning, God, and we thank you that you are the good shepherd. We thank you that you are the one that leads us, that protects us, that feeds us. And Lord, I ask that if there is any fear in this room in giving unto you, Lord, that you would free any person, that your perfect love would rest upon them, that, that there would be a great trust in you and a yieldedness to your voice, God. That above anything else, we would trust in your name, that we would trust in your word, God. There is no great, greater place than to give into your hands, God. So this morning, would we give unto you the glory due your name? Would you soften our hearts to you, God? Would we look like you, Jesus? Make us generous givers to joyfully give unto you, Lord. I ask that you would bless each giver in this room this morning, God. We love you, Jesus. Have your way in your precious name, amen. Amen. As you guys give this morning, you guys can raise your hand if you need an envelope and an usher will bring you one. We have the number on the screen that you can text. And for those of you watching online, there's a number on your screen as well. You guys can rush the buckets and we will be right back.
Good morning, everyone. Can we stand? Can we give the Lord praise? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, precious Lord, for your goodness, your mercy. Let's just lift our hands to him. We ask you, Lord, to speak to us. Show us your ways. Teach us your ways that we might know you and walk, you, walk with you, love you, fear you. Fill us again this morning with the precious power of the Holy Spirit. And I do ask again, Lord, make, make us the most grateful church in America. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, Zach, I'm not getting anything into my ear. Nothing. Huh? What's that? You'll fix it here? Okay. Okay. Oh, there we go. All right, that was too much of my voice. All right, good morning, everyone. You guys doing well? Welcome to the house of God. Isn't it wonderful to be in his presence? Uh, how many of you are here for the very first time? Would you just raise your hand? Wow, look at all of you. Could we please thank them, everyone, honor them? privilege to have you, and uh, if, you, if you would please, it'd be wonderful if our team had the chance to meet you in the lobby after service. It's a real privilege and honor. Thank you so much for, for coming and, um, and uh, worshiping the Lord with us. All right, just a few things. Um, you're going to notice increased security uh, right now. 
And over the next, I don't know, few weeks, or maybe even into however long we need to. My first job outside of leading you to Jesus is to keep you safe and to keep the kids safe. Amen? Amen. Hopefully you appreciate that. And uh, as you know, uh, there's been a lot going on in America regarding churches and uh, gatherings. I'm sure you saw what happened in Kansas City. I'm sure you saw what happened at Lakewood. And unfortunately, those kinds of things happen all too often. They are happening all over, especially with what recently happened last week in, in Jerusalem. All of that is connected and it stirs stuff up. So we are happy to make the investment to protect you and do our very best in that area. So I think we should just thank our incredible security team and our law enforcement. I know some people were like, well, what would the people think? I'm like, trust me when I tell you, they'll be way happier. If I'd rather be inconvenienced a bit and be protected than, than the opposite. And uh, you're welcome. Thank you. I was waiting for somebody to say that. Thank you. So who said that? Who said that? Yeah, you get a free hoodie. I, I mean, I'll buy it. I'll buy it. So it's not free for me. Can we give her a hoodie? Okay, I'll buy that for you. Thank you. That'll teach the rest of you to not agree and be... And I'm serious, you're going to get a free hoodie today that I'm paying for. You're welcome. That's all it took. See, it didn't take much. And some people are like, why do you need protection if you're a Christian? I'm like, you and I have a much different outlook on survival. I was not born in a convent. I'm born in, in Tarpon Springs, Florida. We have a much different version of... Uh, self-defense <laughs> and Jesus had a 12-man security team he did and he had to calm them down a few times you're welcome all right okay tonight will be another sacred night of prayer it's, last week was glorious wasn't that amazing and uh, we could feel things moving in the spirit I love how Pastor Benny just materializes in the green room and finds his way through the <laughs> through the curtain. I love that. And uh, he actually has a massive crusade coming up. Is it this week? He leaves this week. Leaves this week. They're expecting over a million people a night in Nairobi. And uh, uh, every main church denomination in the nation will be present and represented. He's actually going at the invitation of the president. And the first lady of Kenya actually flew here herself to invite Pastor Benny and us to Nairobi. So we're sending him out as a missionary to test the ground. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. I never thought the day would come. He's on our mission staff now. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I think he's coming through tonight. Uh, not to minister, but I want us to show up. This is just one reason. And I want us to pray the glory of God down in Nairobi, can you? And I want us to pray just a, a fresh anointing and a blessing over him. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And then we're going to pray again, listen, for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit among us. So y'all showed up in droves on Super Bowl night. I was so proud of you. And uh, if you were like me, you recorded it and stayed up way too late and felt like you were at a frat party the next morning. <laughs> that was rough on my body. But uh, tonight, let's gather again. We're going to worship and follow the river of the Holy Spirit. My house shall be called a house of prayer, the scripture says. We must learn to pray uh, better than we, we learn to be spectators. Amen? All right. So that's tonight. Jesus 24. Can we throw that up? Yeah. I, look, look. I want this church showing up as missionaries to the West Coast. So... June the 6th through the 8th, um, this will be a historic, not only week for our ministry, but we believe for the nation. Uh, I'm sure you've heard me talk about this before, but that part of the world has been used in God's sovereignty to catalyze uh, movements that change the whole world. You know, Billy Graham's crusade started right there in Southern California. It took one a newspaper article, and it launched him for an entire generation. 
obviously the Jesus People Movement, Southern California, Calvary Chapel right there in Orange County, right where we're going to be. Miss Kuhlman ministered in the exact building that we're using. The full gospel businessmen held their yearly conference right there. I'm talking about, do you know the glory of God fell so powerfully in those full gospel meetings? One in Miami was so glorious that they called the fire department because people watching from the outside saw fire burning up on, on, the, on, the, on the roof. That's, that's a fact. They could see it outside. And so what we're stepping into is really, really, really incredible. The vineyard movement birthed right there in Anaheim, right where we're going to be. And, and, and we believe we're walking according to what the Lord is speaking. And we believe what will happen there this week, the entire world will feel it. Amen. Or that week, I should say. The entire world will feel it. Say amen. amen. So if, if you need to start putting money aside now, do it. Um, our choir members, many of them, hopefully all of them, are going to be flying out there. I don't want to go anywhere without our choir because it's an unfair fight against the devil. It's like a wall of praise behind you. If you can't preach with them behind you, you should really retire uh, and find something else to do. So that's June 6th through the 8th. Get there. It'll be incredible. March 22nd, again, we are coming to Phoenix, Arizona for the West Coast Jesus Tour. That's next month. And if you want to get in, you need to register very, very quickly. Okay. Lastly, I will be preaching at youth next Wednesday night, okay? So we need to start, yeah, we need to start deeply investing in this next generation. And uh, for all of you young people or those of you who wish you were young, um, well, you can't come in, but you can stretch your hands from outside the door. But uh, for those of you who have youth, you have children, send them. I'm gonna pray over them, lay hands on them, and believe God that he will... Just touch them with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Okay, so that's next Wednesday night. All right, take your Bibles if you would. To Deuteronomy, <laughs> verse, or chapter 5. Before I give you the verse, let's pray. Holy Spirit, you are our teacher. And we ask you to teach us. We ask you, Lord, to teach us as we come as low as we possibly know to come, like Mary who sat at your feet and heard your word. Give us the holy fear of the Lord. In Jesus' mighty and holy name. Amen. We ended last week with the temptation of the Lord Jesus. Hopefully, was that a blessing to you guys? You have no reason to lose when temptation comes your way. And my challenge to all of you was to think about the areas that you are most frequently tempted in and find three scriptures in each of those areas. Memorize them, write them down, and have them as ready weapons for the moment. You do not want to be digging through your Bible when the devil comes knocking. You want to have them ready as David was ready for Goliath and his brothers, right? Goliath and his four brothers equals five, and that's why David pulled five smooth stones out of the creek. He was ready to kill them all. I said he was ready to kill them all. Now, David had an issue with Goliath because Goliath insulted the God that David loved. But David did not choose another man's weaponry. Saul offered him his armor. What's the point there? Is you only take into battle what you've mastered in private. You, your, your friend's testimony, your mom's testimony, your dad's testimony, your pastor's testimony is not going to get you through that moment. You must find scripture on your own and make sure they are smooth stones, as I said two weeks ago. They're processed by the Lord in the creek bed that David pulled them out of in the river of God's presence. Now, I've been to that creek bed. It's the first place I ever went to in Israel. And it blew me away because uh, hit there we had our Bible open. And as I was uh, 
I'm sorry. As I stood there with my Bible open, I, I was blown away because it's so accurate. And the scripture says that the Philistines are on this mountain. The Israelites are on this mountain. There's a plain in between and a creek that runs right through it. And there we are. And I'm going, yep, there's a mountain, there's a mountain, there's a plain, there's a creek. Oh, my gosh. It just blew me away. And I actually went down into the creek bed and got my own five smooth stones and kept them. And they're still in a bag at our house. That would have been 20 years ago. So this is a real thing, and I want you all to be ready because here's the deal. While God does not use, I'm sorry, while God does not tempt us, he is desiring to give us more authority on the other side of the temptation. God uses the devil like a puppet. It just doesn't feel like it when it's happening. You can step into big devil, little God syndrome in the midst of a season of temptation. All right? But as I said, you do not win with experience. You do not win with somebody else's resume. You must find scripture on your own. Now, I'd rather you, if you can't think of any, I'd rather you <laughs> use one on all of them if you have to. But I think it's a beautiful challenge for all of you to think about what plagues you the most. You know, you can be tempted to be fearful. You, it's not sexual. Sexual is not the only form of temptation or substance abuse, whatever. Fear is a sin. Unless it's the fear of God. The Bible says, do not be anxious. Be anxious for nothing. So when I feel like being anxious, that's a temptation. I want you to begin seeing it that way. All right? And I love, I love the way Bill frames it. While I can't keep a bird from landing on my head, I'm thinking, man, I, f I feel like I could. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> you saw him coming? I mean, I'm not just going to be like, here you go, you know? <laughs> while, I, while, while I can't... <laughs> Keep a bird from landing on my head. Bill says, I can keep him from building a nest. Yeah. So, temptations come. You do not have to bow. I said, you do not have to bow. And if you fail in a temptation, it is not God's fault. Do you realize that every single uh, resource has been acquired for you to win every time? Think about it. The blood of Jesus is a hedge and a weapon. The cross of Christ is a mighty weapon. Find scriptures about the cross. I pray scriptures about the cross just about daily. When I'm feeling an onslaught from the devil, you know, something about pastoring is you, you go through these seasons of joy, pain, all of it, uh, unhealthy fear, it all comes in waves, and then you have these like lulls that are a blessing, and then it comes again. I've learned to glory in the cross, and I'm learning it daily. So I pray passages like he's been rendered powerless by the cross of Christ. I've determined to know nothing except Christ and him crucified, right? So that's another one. You have the cross, you have the blood, you have the name of Jesus. Oh my gosh, what a name! The name at which every knee will bow, every tongue confess, that he is Lord. There is no name under heaven other, by which man can be saved other than the name of Jesus. We're talking about the holy name of God. The name of Jesus flogs the devil. He hates his name. For many reasons, I don't have time to get into them all. But he hates his name. Learn to use the name of Jesus. Learn to glory in the name of Jesus and him crucified. Ah. The word of God is a weapon. So we have the name, we have the cross, we have the blood, we have the word. You don't have to lose. Prayer is a weapon. Worship. I don't like to call worship a weapon, even though it is. I don't like to call any of these or limit them to weapons. Because I think we get too into spiritual warfare and we don't realize the highest form of spiritual warfare is first love. 
Some of the weirdest people I've ever met are the ones who are so into spiritual warfare. Everything's a devil. You get a bad golf shot, it's a demon. <laughs> Rebuking devils because they gained six pounds that month. I'm like, homie, you ate a donut every day. <laughs> that is not the devil. It's like, we got, we're some of the, I mean, bizarre stuff, right? But it's a real thing. But we, we, we're not telling people how to win. This is how you win, by burning in love with Jesus. I, I, so many of your sins would die if they were ignored. Not ignored, not merely ignoring them like they're not there. They're being ignored because you're enamored with the sun. How much work do you have to put into a tree to get it to die? Not a whole lot. I mean, you could cut it down at the root, or you could just not water it. You could just not give it sunlight. Well, the spiritual life, uh, the fuel of the spiritual life is attention. The sins I struggled with in college died when I got stuck in Christ. When he captured my vision. They were invigorated when I warred against them all the time. Oftentimes we think we're binding and rebuking. We're just dumping gas on them. We think that little flame's going to go away by screaming at it. No, no. The flame goes away because it's ignored because I'm giving all my attention to someone else. You can't passively just ignore something. But I am saying the way to be free is by being enamored with Jesus. They just fell off. It just died. I don't know how to explain it. I noticed like three months later, wow, I don't even want that anymore. Wow, that's gone. Huh. Huh. The Lord delivered me because he showed me his face. You know? So there's no reason to lose. There's no reason to lose. Every, every weapon I just gave you is like a, a nuclear bomb. How about praise? The next time, the other day I was down sitting there in our, in our master bedroom and just feeling down and I just, I heard some, I think it was Pastor Benny, he said, you know, the Lord enjoys it when we praise him when things are great, but if, if we're having a rough day, just, if you'll erupt in praise, it just means so much to him. So I started, things shifted in five minutes. Just, the issue didn't, well, I guess in some ways the issue does go, does go away because if the issue's not in our heart, it's not an issue to us. It's like, is that real? Well, not to us. Wrong guy. Right? Mm, praise, worship. I hope you're writing these down. <laughs> praise, worship, prayer. Praise, worship, prayer. The blood. The name of Jesus. The word of God. The cross of Christ. Come on, how could we lose against a defeated foe? Now, on the way out of the temptation, we see what happens with the Lord, and this is where I want to go now. So now we're moving. We went from the baptism of the Lord into the season of temptation in the wilderness. He was led by the Spirit because God had something great in store for him. Remember, if God is allowing the temptation, it's because he wants to give you authority and power on the other side. So the Lord comes through, Remember his weapons, fasting, prayer, solitude, the word. What were the Lord's weapons in the wilderness? Fasting, prayer, solitude, the word. Say it together. Fasting, prayer, solitude, the word. One more time. Fasting, prayer, solitude, the word. Now he comes out ready to begin his ministry. Now, most people forget that season of temptation in the wilderness. They go straight from the Jordan, when the Holy Spirit descends upon him, straight into his, his ministry. But they forget that season, that 40 days. Do not ever forget what I'm about to tell you. Your private victory will lead you into public victory. I've, 
Well, I've had times in prayer when I've been all alone where it felt like the hordes of hell were released against me for days. I've seen with my eyes the powers of darkness many times. When I first started seeking the Lord, it, it, it rattled me because I just wanted the devil to be real to everyone else. <laughs> and I discovered something that in that seeking, it sent a pulse like a shockwave through demonic powers. It got their attention. And prior to that, I was speaking occasionally, but I, that, that onslaught from darkness, I mean, I've, I've had nights of such warfare, and I don't mean fear and anxiety, I mean seeing things that freaked me out while Jesse's just having a glorious night sleeping right next to me. <laughs> so, you know, I would do these 40-day fasts, and I remember before I went to Greece, literally with my eyes, seeing demons. And I didn't, that wasn't why I was fasting and praying. <laughs> I didn't fast so I could be tempted and attacked. But it was real. And you learn much in those moments. And you start to win private battles. And nobody knows about them. And even if it's not that graphic, you start to win private battles in secret that give you authority. Because you can preach the Bible and not have authority. Well, I shouldn't say that. The Bible is, the, is an authority. It is the ultimate authority. However, some preach John 3.16 way differently than others. And authority is purchased in secret first. Because authority comes from the tangible presence of the Lord and private victory. Last night, I'll give you an example. Yesterday morning, I spent, I don't know, a couple hours with the Lord and felt the Lord drawing me at about two o'clock. I was out, out and about trying to enjoy a pseudo day off. If you live with Jess, you never have a day off, especially if she's friends with Carla. <laughs> I'm joking, not really. But. So I was just driving down the road and I felt this draw to be with the Lord. So I drove to the house, shut the door, and just sat there. It was glorious. Those are private victories. I could have easily said no. But you have to realize that God, God makes a record of every private victory. Eventually, they stack up and begin to try to break the wall of the dam. And eventually that wall breaks and the water comes spewing forth. That's what we call the favor of, of God. People who truly walk with the Lord and lead, they don't just arrive. There's, there, there are decades, decades of private victories. Little ones. So don't diminish you know, you're at the store and you're on your way home and you feel like, you know what, I guess I could watch TV or scroll, but I feel the Lord saying, spend some time in my word. That's a victory. It's a victory because the flesh is uh, losing its strength in those moments. And this is how capacity grows. So the Lord comes out of that season in the wilderness comes on the scene and we know well actually Mark Deuteronomy 5 let's just quickly go to Luke's gospel and we'll look at chapter 4 notice that verse 13 is the end of chapter I should say Luke 4.13 is the end of the temptation time in the wilderness. And 14 begins, it's really the initiation or the, 
arrival of his ministry. And then Jesus returned. Let's look at verse 14. In the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Notice he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit and now he returns to Galilee with the power of the Spirit. And there is a difference. The power of God flows from the presence of the Spirit, yes. But this 40-day fast and victory over temptation unleashed a power upon his ministry. Does that make sense to you? Pre the presence of the Lord is glorious. If you have to choose between his presence and power, always choose his presence. But the Bible teaches in Habakkuk that his power comes from his hand. The, in, it says, in his hand was the hiding of your power. In other words, in him, in the Lord Jesus, the power of Jesus is hidden. But Jesus is led of the Spirit into the wilderness and comes out of the wilderness in the spirit and power. Quick, quick side note, there are certain fasts that will trigger certain breakthroughs in your life. You need to know when to use them. Now I'll never tell you to fast. I can only invite you into a life of fasting. But for instance, Esther's fast was a three day no food fast. That was a May Day fast. The Jews were gonna be slaughtered. She had to step in. She needed an instant miracle. She needed the tables to turn. And God turned an entire nation. Esther fast, that's a three day fast. Then you have a Daniel fast. I can't get to all these. The Daniel fast is a 21 day fast. It's a veggie fast or a, the old saying is no meats, no sweets. There are different variations. Uh, in, at ORU, Jess would call a Daniel fast and eat bean and cheese burritos at Taco Bell. <laughs> I'm like, that does not, that doesn't count at all. You can't go frying up cheese and beans and tortillas and call, tell me you're fasting. I know someone else who gained weight on a liquid fast because they were pounding McDonald's milkshakes every day. <laughs> Literally. You know. I mean, if you've got to like find these loopholes, have a blast. <laughs> now the Daniel fast, the Daniel fast, we, we see this in, 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 in Daniel's account. You can go back home and read through it. Daniel fast unleashes revelation, a, a dream life, and the scriptures opening up to you. And I hate to say, can cause a disturbance in the heavenlies. So you got to know what you're doing when you're strong. Be careful. You need to be careful. I'm telling you. Because you, you don't want to go down these roads unprepared. That's good pastoring right there. I'm just, I'm just saying. I've seen a lot of people get wacky because they didn't know when to fast and they didn't know what they were doing. But we know this because when... When Gabriel speaks to Daniel, he says he was resisted by the prince, and it took him time to get through. The fast I'm talking about here is the fast that Moses experienced more than once, and the fast that the Lord Jesus walked through in the wilderness. That's a 40-day liquid fast. What did Moses experience? The glory of God, the presence and power of the Spirit, and insane authority. Insane in the best way. It's a modern term. I don't want anyone to think I'm <laughs> saying that about Moses. Incredible authority is released. Moses comes down. His face is shining. God gives him the law. I think that's authority. He is the leader of a nation of three million people. Jesus comes forth from that fast in the spirit and power. Say Amen. That's what that fast produces. Anytime you encounter God, you don't go into fast, by the way, to gain authority or power. You, you, you go into fast to, to encounter the Lord. The fruit of that encounter is power and authority. All right? Now, in Luke 4, Jesus, now we're going to journey together as a church out of the wilderness into his ministry, and then I'll get into his teachings. But I want you to look here 
at uh, verse 15. And he taught in the synagogues, being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth, which was his hometown, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. I love that. Verse 16. Where does Jesus start? The scriptures. Jesus read the Bible to the synagogue. We should read the Bible. <laughs> and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, here you have the word opening the word. Unreal. He found the place where it was written. Now we see what the Lord does with the scriptures. He says, this is me. That's all he'll ever do, by the way. He's going to open the text and go, this is me. And in verse 18, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. So he's talking about this coming of the spirit upon him. And now he tells us why he's upon him. Because he has anointed me. So the anointing is not something. The anointing is a moment in which the Lord Jesus, I should say, in which the Holy Spirit comes upon us. The moment of his coming upon us is the anointing. The verb. And what does the anointing produce? To preach the gospel of the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives. Recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I love this. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. That's what kings do, is they sit down. It's a major statement he's making. This is about me, and by the way, I'm the king. He read it, gave no disclaimer, and he sat down. We need to learn to let the scripture speak. Just let them speak. You know, if God promises to bless his people because they're generous, and God blesses you, just let the Lord bless you. You don't have to tell people you got it on sale. <laughs> Jessie's fought that her whole life. She gets something nice. She feels like because of the way she grew up, she has to explain why she got something nice. Well, somebody gave it to me. You don't need a disclaimer every time. Let the word just speak. Stand on the authority of scripture. Let him speak and sit down. There's something powerful about just reading the word out loud and sitting down because it keeps the authority right where it needs to be. Amen? All right, so now we, now we see that the Spirit is upon the Lord. Let's, let's all just take our seats if we could, please. The authority of the Spirit is upon the Lord now, and that's where I want your head and mind to be, that he's come forth now in power and in authority with the presence and power of the Spirit resting upon him now, what does that look like? Go to Isaiah chapter 11. Who is resting upon the Lord Jesus? Come on, talk to me. Remember, I've got this thing in my ear. Say it loud. The Holy Spirit. All right. We go to Isaiah. Thank you, Lord. Chapter 11. I'm going to do... I usually preach out of the King James, but I'm going to do uh, ESV here. Isaiah 11, verse 1, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump or root of Jesse. That's the Lord Jesus. And a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Okay. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. That's exactly what happened at the baptism of the Lord Jesus. What is the Holy Spirit like? We call this the sevenfold Spirit of the Lord. It does not mean there are seven Holy Spirits. I taught this at Jesus School this week. This is about the sevenfold Spirit, the seven, the seven beautiful revelations of the Holy Spirit. And there are more than seven, by the way. He's limitless. I said he's limitless. You spend your whole life gazing upon him. 
However, there's seven here that the Lord is touching on. So number one, he's the spirit of the Lord. Wow. That means he is the Lord, he is in charge, he is master. Amen? I'm getting somewhere here. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and this is where I want to I focus today, and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be, Jesus' delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. So again, we've come out of the baptism into the wilderness. The Holy Spirit is upon him. Now I'm describing to you scripturally the sevenfold spirit of the Lord that is upon him. Remember, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. If you want to discover the Holy Spirit, look no further than Jesus. That's what he's like. Remember, Jesus reveals, he's the divine express revelation of God, the very icon of God. He's the perfect picture of the Father and the perfect picture of what it looks like to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. So here it says that that final fold is the fear of the Lord and then here in verse, verse three, the scriptures take it even further about the Lord Jesus. The scriptures say his delight is in the fear of the Lord. Now how many of us, when we hear the term fear of the Lord, feel delight well if we want to be like Jesus we need to people don't fear the Lord anymore this isn't a side issue if the son of God feared the Lord it's a big deal now go to Deuteronomy 5 are you tracking with me here is this okay? Yes. Deuteronomy 5, 29. Listen to the heart of God here. This is the Lord speaking. Oh, that they would, oh, sorry. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep my commandments. Listen to the promise. That it might be well with them and their children forever. Do you hear the heart of God there in the opening of verse 29? Oh! It's like you can hear our Heavenly Father saying, I want you to do this so badly because it would bless you and your children forever. You know why people are not afraid to judge other people? Because they do not fear the Lord. Do you know why people do and say things that they should never do and say? Because they do not fear the Lord. You know how people just walk in to a gathering and just treat it lightly? It's because they forgot that he's the Lord. In the early church, they would have this inscription that would say, enter with love, mercy, and fear. Love, mercy, and fear. You need it all, or the mercy is unsanctified, or the love is not true. If you remove the fear of the Lord and his holiness, Calvary loses its glory. It's cheapened. It's cheapened when you discover how holy he is. And then I say, he died for you. That is proper and it means so much more. When I first started walking with Joy Dawson in 2006, she told me something that I didn't agree with. She said the, 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 the last great revelation that will hit the church regarding Jesus will be the fear of the Lord. I said, no, Joy, I think you're wrong. I think it'll be the love of God. She said, you'll never see the love of God properly, son, without understanding the fear of the Lord. But I want you to look back down at verse 29 and hear the heart of God. I don't want you to read it like these are mere words. Oh, you can almost hear that painful groan, that yearning. 
deep in the heart of our Heavenly Father. Oh, that they had such a heart in them. That means he wants us to fear him at a heart level. That they would fear me and always keep my commandments. So we see the connection between obedience and the fear of the Lord. And what is the promise again? That it might be well with them? Anybody want life to go well? How about for your children? Half of you want life to go well. Anybody want life to go well? What about for your children? But this isn't limited to just our actual children. The scriptures here says children forever. That means the entire family line. If one of you would step in as a priest as a mom, as a dad, as a sister, as a brother, if one of you, you would just step in and say, I'm going to live a life that fears the Lord. The generations could be impacted forever after you. Hallelujah. I really do miss Joy's teachings. Proverbs 8.13. Is this okay today? Yes. Proverbs 8.13. Maybe some of you are, are asking the question, what is the fear of the Lord? David, could you get a mic, please? We, we need to know what it is. There's all types of definitions, you know, some are right, some are not. It's, it's to be uh, deeply... Uh, in awe of God, yes. There, there's a definition that applies to the reverential awe of God, yes. But let's let the Bible speak. Proverbs 8, 13, David. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. There you go. What is the fear of the Lord? One of the definitions, the hatred of evil. The Bible defines one of the definitions as loving God as the hatred of sin. We should hate evil because he evil, evil is an attack against the very image of God. Evil destroys lives. The fear of the Lord is the hatred of evil. Can you see that? You want another one? I'll read you this one. Go to Malachi. Say, I want the fear of the Lord. I'm going to teach you how to get the fear of the Lord maybe next week. not given up on New King James. <coughs> Can you get the ASV? Can, on your phone? Okay, okay. Read me Malachi 2 verses 5 through 6. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. Whoa. Say that again. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. Let me read New King James. I gave to him that he might fear me. So he feared me. Read verse 6 there, David. True instruction was in his mouth and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. Mm. Mm. If you look at the end of verse five, it says, and he stood in awe 
of my name. Okay, hold on here. That means one of the definitions of the fear of the Lord is to stand in awe of the name of the Lord. It, it's to, 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 to understand that I am not talking about Joe Schmo here. When I put his name on my lips, there are consequences. When I claim to stand in his name and behave properly or improperly, there are consequences that are good or bad. The fear of the Lord, according to Malachi 2, verse 5, is to stand in awe of his name. All right? So according to Proverbs 8, 13, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. The second definition, according to Malachi 2, verse 5, is to stand in awe of of the name of the Lord. That's amazing. Now when we think of the name of the Lord, of course, we're in love with the name of Jesus here. But let's look at some Old Testament declarations. Just give me five more minutes. Look at Exodus 3, verse 14. I'll start in verse 13. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said this to Moses, I am who I am. Who else has a name like that? Now, when they asked the Lord Jesus in John chapter 8, regarding who he claimed to be. What did he say? He called himself the I am. So when we speak of the Lord Jesus, listen very carefully, we are talking about the great I am. And we should stand in awe of that name. When we carry the name Christian, and literally embrace the name and his office, we should stand in awe of the name of the Lord as we claim to be his own. This is what it looks like to fear him. You know, one of the coolest things that I've been able to watch lately, people will send me videos or pictures, is churches all over America now are putting crosses up on their platforms. It makes me so happy. And I'm not saying we're the reason, but I do think, I know a lot of them, and I know that a lot of them were inspired because of the cross here. But what I want to make clear to these people who I love is that it's not about putting something up on a platform that is like this magic secret. Now more people are doing choirs, right? It, this isn't like a, a puzzle that gives you a bigger following. This is here because the cross means something so dear to me, I don't have words for it, privately in my heart, I could not even begin to explain to you how much I was taught to revere the cross. I don't put crosses on the ground at home. I don't put my Bible on the ground. So when you guys, I remember when the Bethel teams came two years ago and they were processing their time here, which was such an honor, they came with Bill. They said, uh, Bill allowed me into their meeting. They debriefed their time here and he, he let me sit in on the meeting and they all said, we experienced such a holy reverence. Remember, a church will always take on the identity and characteristics of its leadership team. So that's there because we value the holy cross of Christ. Deep, deep within our hearts. We value suffering with our mouths closed. We value nothingness in the eyes of the world because that is the uniform of every believer right there. 
We value the God who came to show us what love looks like. By dying at the very vision of the cross, something happens in our souls here. Now, the reason I don't put my Bible on the ground is because it's the Bible. It's, I don't come from a, a part of the, the world where you just do things and they don't mean anything. Names mean something. Prophetic act means something. Sacraments mean something. Where somebody sits at a table in our culture means something. If my dad walks in, he gets the head of the, the table. If Pastor Benny walks in, he gets the head of the table. I gladly give it away. In the, some parts of the West, that's not the case. You just kind of do whatever you want. But we honor offices if you honor the cross. Because it's a pleasure. A cruciform life goes, I prefer you as being better than me. That's what we do. That's who we are. You understand? So it comes from a deep-seated, real, authentic, secret life. You can't just put crosses up if you don't value the cross and expect the people to be electrified by the glory of the cross. Now, I'd rather one be up there than not because the Lord loves it and devils hate it. However, however, when we carry the name of Jesus, we must stand in awe of that name. I want awe to return to our hearts. Give me five more minutes. I want awe to return to our hearts. I want you, when you, do you know how many times I've grabbed my Bible? I don't just flip the thing around and, no, gosh, this is the holy, precious word of God. There are libraries. There was one here in Orlando at the Holy Land experience that uh, I, think, I think they've sold it since. But I looked at a Bible in the Holy Land experience that had a monk's blood, that had a monk's blood on it because he was, in, he was translating the scriptures and when they came to kill him, he threw his body over the book and when the Muslims killed him, he bled. The Ottomans killed him. He bled on the pages. They had that Bible. So we just grab our Bible from the Christian bookstore, you know, put a sticker on it. But who cares? I'm not saying you can't put a sticker. I'm just saying, this, it's not a car. It's not an Apple computer where we just throw it. I mean, this is the holy, precious, written word of God that is the expression of his heart. I've had times in bed where I've had my Bible, I've just held it on my chest, thanking the Lord for his precious word. I've kissed my Bible. I feel, oh, thank you, Jesus, for your word that is life, that is spirit and life. And the longer I do this, when, when I'm down, the more I value the word of God. That's what the fear of the Lord looks like. It doesn't mean you're freaked out, afraid of everything. It actually means you'll be afraid of less. Psalm 33, verse 8 and 9. This is where I'm going to end. David, if you could read Psalm 33, verses 8 and 9, please. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. Mm. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe and awe of him. For he spoke. Now, now here the psalmist is telling us why. This is why you should fear him. Because he merely spoke and everything came to be. He commanded and it stood forth. The trees stood forth at his command. Stars are where they need to be because of his command. And so the psalmist writes, who is man that you're mindful of him? So David has no problem saying, let all the earth and every inhabitant fear the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord? To hate evil, to stand in awe of his name, to obey him. Let me read you one more verse. Matthew 10, verse 28, David, if you don't mind. Matthew 
And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Hold on a minute. Isn't that what we spend most of our time doing? Self-preservation. I protect me from you. The Bible says here, read it again, David. And do not fear those who kill the body. But this is the fear of man. It's the fear of man. And if you walk in the fear of the Lord, your test will always be regarding the fear of man. Keep reading, David. Rather fear him who can kill, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Okay, now, I've heard definitions, and I think they're right. I just think they're partial. Do you think this definition lines up with this verse? Don't be afraid of God. Uh, be afraid of being away from God. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But Jesus is upping the ante here. He's saying there is one who can destroy your body and soul in hell forever. Fear him. I've heard a lot of people say, oh, the fear of the Lord doesn't make you afraid. It's not that kind of fear. Oh, really? That sounds pretty scary. Now, next week, I'm going to teach on trembling at his word. That is a fruit of the fear of the Lord. The Bible teaches us on multiple occasions. Tremble, Jeremiah said, at his word. You, have you ever seen anyone tremble at his word? I have. I've, I, it's happened to me. They're freaked out. Have you ever seen an angel? Do you think there's a reason why the angels have to say, fear not, when they show up? Because it's scary. <laughs> and here the Lord says, don't be afraid of people who can kill the body. Fear the one who can destroy body and soul in hell. We need a healthy dose of the fear of the Lord. Actually, I'm going to read this to you and then I'm going to pray. Psalm 99, <coughs> verse 1. Psalm 99, 1. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. Do you know what verse 3 says? Can you put up verse 3? Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy, or he is, the original text would say, holy is he. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. Yesterday, we were at the retreat property, and Meg and Jess were in there working, and I came in to bother them and just harass them a little bit. And I got my fishing rod and went out and the court, <coughs> the court was there. And the court didn't know that I was studying the fear of the Lord yesterday morning. Just felt in my heart. Study the fear of the Lord. And I thought, well, what's this have to do with the Lord coming out of the wilderness? I said, Lord, I told the church I would walk them through this journey with Jesus. And he said, just stay with it. What happened when he came out of the wilderness? The Holy Spirit was resting upon him in power. Who is the Holy Spirit? Sevenfold Spirit, Spirit of the fear of the Lord. Boom, I found the connection. And Court had had a dream, and I won't share the details of it, but as I was fishing, she was sharing the dream about the fear of the Lord touching our church or our, 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 our ministry. And I said, Court, I, I've been studying that all morning. Now, the Bible teaches that we can ask for the fear of the Lord. Let's do it. Let's ask the Lord for his holy fear. So why don't you all stand up? Now, the fear of the Lord, as I said earlier, before we ask, is the hatred of evil. It is the refusal to tolerate it. That's not extreme. It seems extreme today. But it's the Bible. It is the gospel. It is who Jesus is. If you've tolerated, listen, 
if you've tolerated sin in your life, you need a hatred for sin. If sin is reigning in your life, you need a love for God that is so great that it produces a hatred for what mars his image in your life. So before we ask, as a church family, and how many of you believe that when we ask, the Lord will answer? I don't know how he's going to answer. I don't know how that will manifest or what it will look like. But I believe in a God who is present among us, who is listening. Do you? Yes. All right. With every head bowed and eye closed, before we ask. If you need to be free from sin, and you know it, and you're dealing with shame and condemnation, and you feel like a slave under its weight, Jesus can set you free right now. I said right now. If that's you, lift your hand very quickly and put it down. If you raised your hand or wish you did, get down here very quickly. And as they start coming, I want our church to celebrate them and honor them. Can we do that? Come. You just come down. Come to Jesus. Give the Lord all the praise. All the praise. Oh, I wish I could scream. I'm not allowed anymore. Come on. Give the Lord all the praise. All the glory. This is wonderful. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Father. If you brought someone this morning and you know sin is ruling and reigning in their life, I want you to look at them right now and say, I'll go down with you. Come on. It doesn't matter if they're uncomfortable. Don't fear them. Don't fear them. Fear the Lord. If, if, trust me when I tell you. It's better that they refuse it now and that your hands be clean. If you know, if you know they need the Lord, if you know they need the Lord, look them right in the eye. Just take the rejection as a gift if they reject you. Say, you know, I'd rather, I would rather see you be rejected right now than you fear them. Fear the Lord. Look them right in the eye and say, come on, let's go to Jesus. They can say no. You're not removing their free will. But you do your work. You do your part. This is how souls are won. You stop fearing man. God bless you all. They're still coming. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Give you all the praise. All the praise. Thank you, Jesus. I want us to pray a prayer of confession of sin and repentance. I want us to all do it because we're going to receive Holy Communion in about five minutes. So let's all pray. Holy Father, come on out loud. Holy Father, I've sinned against you. I confess my sin. Wash me with the blood of Jesus. Cleanse my soul. Free me from sin's power. With the precious blood of the Lamb. Jesus, you died for my sin. You shed your blood. You've been raised from the dead. You're seated at the right hand of the Father. You are the King of glory. You are the King of the universe. The King of heaven and the King of my heart. Take my life as I surrender to you now. I lay my life down at your holy feet. Pick it up and do what you will. I repent of my sin. And I turn to you, precious Lord. Make me brand new. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord all the praise. Now what I'd like to do, now for those of you who came forward, I'm going to ask you to meet with our team right there in the lobby. You'll see the booth. In that booklet in your hands is a, are some simple steps on how to walk with Jesus. Make sure to read it. Don't throw it away. We went through a lot of work to, to provide that for you. And there's no waste, to, there's no waste in there. It's, it's really wonderful. And it's a blessing. Now I want us as a church 
to ask for the fear of the Lord. So everyone just lift your hands. And I'm going to lead us off and I'm going to ask you to just repeat after me. Let's really settle in here and give the Lord our attention. For those of you watching all over the world, make this the prayer for you and your family and your churches. Say this, mighty God, release the fear of the Lord into my heart. Forgive me for treating you lightly, for treating your work lightly, for treating what is precious to you as being common. Lord, you anointed Jesus with the oil of gladness above his fellows because he hated iniquity. Your word says that in Hebrews. Give me true joy, which is found in the fear of the Lord. Now just lift your hands to heaven. Say, Father, I want to fear you. Now, Holy Spirit, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would begin to flow through this room and fill our hearts with the wonder of the fear of the Lord. We want to tremble at your word. Teach us to love what you love and hate what you hate. And glorify the holy name of Jesus through us. Would the ushers come with the communion, please? Thank you, wonderful Lord. Let's just keep praying, church. Keep asking him. Send your holy fear, Lord. Send your wonderful fear. Come, Holy Spirit, in the fear of the Lord. The spirit of the fear of the Lord. Hallelujah. Just begin to bless him in, in the spirit all over the room. Come on, ask him for yourself. I remember asking the Lord with joy to teach me to fear him and how it worked. Holy Father, I pray now that as these, your servants come down to offer the precious body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to your people, I pray that the wonderful Holy Spirit would come upon these elements. We do not just receive natural bread and the fruit of the vine, but your very body and blood. Heal your people this morning. Fill your people this morning. Protect them and forgive us with your holy blood. In the blessed name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to receive communion now. For those of you who are here for the first time, the ushers will dismiss us row by row to come up and receive the elements. We'll serve these precious folks up here first. And you'll come down, you'll take the elements, you'll go back to your seat. We ask that you do not receive it alone, that you receive it with somebody else that you can pray with and believe God with. And if you're sick in body or you need a breakthrough or a miracle of any kind, come forward in faith to receive the very body and blood of the Lord Jesus and watch his power move through you. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord praise this morning? Thank you, Jesus. We'll see you tonight. And may the Lord touch you as you receive Holy Communion.
We believe that the nations will descend on this land. That the sick will be healed here. That the lost will be saved here. That the presence of the glory of God will rest here. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. That the mountains might shake at your presence. That the gospel will go forth from here. Shaking the earth for the glory of God. That the presence of Jesus Christ would dwell among us. Here we will enter into the peace of your presence. Here we will remain. Jesus said, remain in me and I in you. Here we will remain. This is holy ground. Where only one thing is needed, Jesus. May Jesus be pleased with all that takes place here. May he be adored and worshiped here. May his word be taught in clarity and love here. As we tell the generations to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works he has done. May the generations come to find him here. To find Jesus here. Here. Together we will build the house of God. And a home for his people. 